This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So I'm uh, like to welcome everybody and call the finance committee meeting for March 6th. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 30A, section 18, this meeting of the finance committee is being conducted via remote participation. So in a moment, what I'm going to do is uh, take the agenda down from the screen and um, ask each member of the finance committee who's present, uh, and I think that everybody but one is here now and all will be present in a few minutes. We know that uh, one member is gonna be a few minutes late. And then uh, we will uh, move to the agenda. And the agenda is essentially item number two, as you see on the screen, though there is one other item. Um, and uh, because uh, I asked Sean to say something about the revised um, financial projections for FY22, um, we do have um, provision for public comment. And I may call on public comment in a couple of different pieces, and I'll explain that as we go along. But public comment is, in, in, uh, is a very important part of all of our council and council committee meetings. And uh, we uh, look forward to hearing from public about um, their questions, concerns, and topic. Um, the one other thing I wanted to mention to anybody who um, has been uh, aware of what our agenda plan originally was for today, we did drop one major item and we'll postpone it probably until April, and that is to have the actuary report from the um, OPEB, other post-employment and benefit um, our section of our liability and discuss that liability at a later stage. So um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment so that I can um, go through and um, we can do introductions. And I'm gonna start by asking each of the members of the committee to uh, acknowledge that uh, they're present and they can hear and uh, we can hear them. And then uh, we'll uh, try and make sure we can get around and introduce each of the other people um, who is present. And uh, as I call on those, our guests, um, be helpful for you to uh, each, um, after I um, take the opportunity to um, explain what your role is in the process um, that, um, in what, uh, so that people know what you're bringing to the table. So with that, let me go with the uh, uh, members of the Finance Committee and start with uh, Vice Chair Kathy Shane. Yes, I can hear you. I'm here. Okay. And um, Lynn Grusmer? Present. Pat DeAngelis is also here. Pat is, oh, you're here now. You're back. So we're all here. Pat DeAngelis, then. Yes, I can hear you. And Dorothy Pam? Yes, I can. And uh, Bob Hegner? Oh, I'm here. Bernie Kubiak. Yes. Can you hear Jane you? Scheffler. I'm here. Okay, so I think that all members of the committee are present. Um, we also have Sean Mangana, who's our finance director, and I think that all of us know Sean. Um, and uh, other people who are present, uh, David Eisenthal. I'm David Eisenthal. <clears throat> I'm a vice president with Unibank Fiscal Advisory Services. I'm the municipal advisor to the town and uh, have provided a lot, much of the analysis working closely with uh, Sean on uh, preparing projections of uh, financial impacts of, the, of this and other projects. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I know we have a couple of trustees present and uh, one is Alex Lefebvre. 
I think Bob Pam is here also. Yes. Who's the, uh, uh, I think the treasurer of the trustees. Uh, and uh, so then the other people who are present, uh, and I'll just, uh, uh, Jim Alexander. Uh, you're muted. Jim Alexander, Fango Alexander Architects from the library. And uh, Doug Keller. Yes, Doug Keller with Epsilon Associates. And George Barnes, I think, is the other person who wanted to introduce. George Barnes, I'm a project manager with Collier's Project Leaders. We're OPMs for the Jones Library. I would like to thank every uh, Buddy, David and Jim and Doug and George for present and Kent Farber is here. So Kent. Uh, thank you very much. I'm the co-chair of the development committee of the Friends of the Jones Library, which is undertaking to raise the gifts for the project. And I realize I missed Elon Tierney from Hi, Elon Tierney from Kuhn Riddle Architects. We did the accessibility study at the Jones Library. So with that, okay. thank you. So I'm going... Andy, we also have Ken Guyette from Collars, Collier's as well. Okay. Um, Should be on here, right, Ken? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what I want to do uh, next is, um, go back to screen sharing for just a moment to show one additional item to give you um, a sense of what it is that we're um, doing now. Let's see if I make sure I have the right um, item on the screen. And I'm afraid that I don't. So I'm gonna have to go back, stop share, because what I wanna do is explain what the process um, that we're going to be going through today so that we can um, understand how we're um, proceeding um, through the, this is the item that I needed to show. So um, at the last finance committee meeting, we identified um, areas that we thought were important categories for questions for consideration um, at this meeting and the next meeting that we then scheduled to hold um, that were financial, which were the first 10 items on the list that you see at the top of the screen. And then we also recognized that there were additional questions which we viewed as non-financial, but realized that we had been receiving a lot of questions in those areas. And um, what um, then, um, as we, as Lynn and I went through the questions, um, we uh, identified two other areas where there were questions that came in that have financial consideration. And uh, as we tried to sort the questions, we couldn't get them into categories one through 10, and we had to create two additional categories. So I wanted to acknowledge that and explain it to the finance committee members who are um, not involved in the discussion and ask uh, that you understand that um, we felt it necessary to put in the two that are listed in yellow in um, which is the uh, just general project oversight and construction management and ownership of the building. Um, I wanna thank Lynn for all of her work in the major document which you have seen which is the questions and answers that have been provided. And I thank all of the people who've helped to provide answers, many of whom are present today. Um, we are going to generally um, deal with the issues that were marked, I mean, exclusively really with the um, ones that are marked with the X under the March 16 date for today. But um, I'm not gonna be able to take them in order because of uh, the need uh, for one person who um, has only a limited amount of time, we are going to actually start with uh, 
number four, the cash flow and financing section, and then come back um, to project oversight and management, um, the other those issues um, after that. So um, with uh, that noted, um, I think that what I'm going to do is turn the screen over to Lynn, and she's going to help us through the um, make sure that we're looking at the right sections of questions as we um, discuss each one and ask for discussion and questions that come up about them. And uh, but we will be doing um, that one section that I think is starts on page nine, Lynn. Uh, first. So, so Andy, do you want me to introduce this section and then go through it? Uh, yes, in just a second, we'll uh, get the participant list up so I can notice as people are. So uh, I think we were. You want to go to cash flow and finance? Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. So, thank so uh, John. Thank you. Uh, um, so yeah. So this section is all about the um, the debt schedules and the cash flow. So I'll give an overview, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, David Eisenthal, our our advisor, financial advisor, who's going to walk through the schedules in a little bit more detail and and um, sort of explain how they work and. Um, some of the assumptions. So there are four debt schedules that are attached. Um, there are two for the addition renovation options and there are two for the repair options. Um, and so all of those schedules are based on cash flow projections that were either put together by Collier's or put together by um, Kuhn Riddle. And the timing associated with, with that is also based on the work of those architects um, or o OPMs. So there's a, there was a question here about the timing, and then we just want to be clear that the, all the financing piece is built upon the assumptions that the architects or, or the OPM used um, for those different options. Um, you'll, when we go through the schedules, you'll see the interest rates, and, and David can highlight that. Um, and then the one last piece before we go there is there was a question on um, what ones include CPA money and historic tax credit money and which ones don't. So the, the expansion and renovation options factor in the CPA and historic tax credits as it's been sort of budgeted throughout this entire project. Um, the repair options do not. And that's not to say that we can't in the future if something changes, but up until this point, we haven't heard or, or seen that the details of those projects where those would be an eligible source of funds. Um, so those have not been included in the repair projects. Um, and then I think with that, we can go to the first table and I'll, I'll let David start to speak, uh, speak to this. Uh, thank you, Sean. Through the chair, um, there the two uh, renovation and addition options that we looked at, option one yeah, yeah, yeah. would be what I would consider to be a more conventional approach to the financing. Uh, as uh, you may know, the uh, uh, MBLC, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners, is going to be starting to pay grants uh, or is expected to be starting to pay grants uh, relatively soon. And so the need for the town to uh, incur uh, to borrowings, to borrow, uh, to fund its share will not really need to happen until um, we're estimating March of 2023 based on the cash flow that Collier's provided. And the uh, this uh, uh, sheet that you are looking at shows debt service, projected debt service, uh, assuming an issuance in March of 2023. Um, and I also, you, know, you can see outstanding debt service, that's the uh, uh, projected outstanding general debt service, uh, just as a comparison uh, of the town. Um, you wanna go down to option 2B uh, this assumes a much sooner issuance, not justified by the um, cash flow of the project. As I said before, the MBLC is expected to start making its grant payments, but 
this would be the point at which the town could borrow and not um, based on the cash flow could uh, reasonably expect to avoid having to uh, calculate arbitrage rebate um, and uh, thus could proceed with a permanent financing uh, in an environment that may, and, I, and I'll say may be more favorable because we're talking about the end of this calendar year rather than uh, the beginning of calendar year 23. Um, I assumed an overall effective rate on the first option of approximately 2.80% uh, projected for this um, December of 21 financing an effective rate of approximately 2.04%. Um, so um, maybe I should stop and ask if there are any questions at this point. Okay, I will. I think David, one thing you might want to speak to real quick is the how the premium is applied in this situation, because that's one of the right. later questions. You could probably yeah, address that I now. Think, you know, I the premium, you know, because we're talking about financings that are going to happen in the next two years. I tried to um, produce somewhat more realistic um, scenarios, uh, including uh, the use of bond premium. And um, you know, these rates that we see are actually net, effectively net rates. These are real effective costs. Uh, and the reason, for example, that you see on the sheet in front of you that the uh, borrowing amount of $14.9 million, but financing 15.7 is that about um, $841,000 in premium is applied to the project. It's, if you can, I think for the non-financial folks, you can kind of think of it as being like points on a mortgage only in reverse. The, uh, you know, you, if, you're, if you have a mortgage, you know you might pay points to the bank uh, that effectively raises the cost of, of borrowing. In this case, bondholders uh, will uh, are willing to pay uh, pay the issuer uh, funds in order to get a higher coupon rate on the bonds. And that's trying to in modeling um, borrowings over the next couple of years. I wanted to try to um, capture that bit of realism. Um, I will say that for um, projections that are out beyond two years, I didn't really factor in premium. Uh, didn't feel like I, we just don't know uh, what market conditions are going to be really. I mean, we have a better sense up to two years, but really beyond two years, it's really uh, um, much harder to make those types of projections. So um, I, I think that's, that's the basis. It's and so these, these costs that you're seeing, the 2.80 and the 2.04 are sort of net of the premium. These are real costs of cap, projected costs of capital under each uh, circumstance. So, um, and the, I'll say that the rates are based on uh, what we think market conditions may be, what the structure of repayment looks like, and um, just and what we just what we think the uh, the market is going to look like uh, at these different times. Also, credit uh, these are the, you know we're assuming that the town continues to uh, have a strong uh, bond rating um, that and that's factored into this as well. So um, maybe go down to the next set of slides. Yeah, it might, yeah, it might make sense just to go through the the next two schedules and then open it up for questions. Yeah, and repair, op repair options one and two, um, I simply projected out uh, what um, the, you know, based on the cash flows that uh, Keen Riddle provided uh, for each of these options, uh, a financing scheme, uh, financing projection based on those uh, uh, cash flows, and that's really, and the interest rates uh, really were based on um, those uh, uh, 
those uh, the timing of those and the structure of those issues. Uh, bans being short-term financings, temporary financings that get permanently financed by general obligation bond issues. And this is really driven, as I say, by um, by cash flow and to a certain extent by um, the um, uh, by uh, fiscal, you know, the idea of trying to uh, um, structure the debt appropriately uh, given the uh, fiscal conditions of the town. So um, at this point, I guess, Sean, do you think, should I carry, should I cover anything else at this point? I think, why don't we go to questions, if that's okay with um, you, Andy, and Lynn, and then I think most people have seen these charts before, so um, we can um, focus on the questions. Okay, so now, uh, Kathy, you have some... Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, my question, I think, is pretty straightforward. Um, if I look at the one you... Um, If I, look at, if I look at the option you've got on the screen, um, option two on repair, which Kuhn Riddle, you are correct, of course, you're correct, um, that they had done in two phases. The second phase was external repairs to the building. If the town were willing to do them all in just one phase, because one is happening outside, one happening inside, um, we potentially saved some money on the escalation. Am I right? in assuming that you could um, apply, uh, you could just think of that amount is now part of the first line, the 12.1 becomes that plus that, and you could get that interest rate, question number one. And then when I look up at your repair, uh, uh, your renovate and expansion option, where you got an even more favorable interest rate by financing it at the end of 2021, um, that's assuming we're ready to go. Would that same financing rate of the 2.04 apply if, if the town said, you know, we're ready to go um, with, with uh, um, so it's not the repair option, but uh, this is the repair option. It's way back up. With the renovation and expansion, you have finance it right away at the end of this year, end of 2021, and you get us down to a 2.04%. If, if you were financing repair option two, which doesn't have to be two phases, it was specced out to be two phases. Am I right in assuming that we could get that same, there's nothing magic about the interest rates, it's just the timing of when we're financing it? It's the timing, it's also the structure. Um, I mean, if there's a big difference, I mean, it doesn't sound like there's gonna be a radically big difference in the borrowing amounts, so the um, costs of issuance should be, the. the the weight of the cost of issuance on the cost of financing should be roughly similar. So I think if you are assuming, and I think in each case we assumed a 20 year repayment on a level debt service or a mortgage like basis, uh, I think that these rates would be representative um, given, the, given those, under those assumptions. Uh, I think I would wanna, if you wanted to see other, uh, I think if you had other um, options, I'd probably want to crunch some more numbers uh, in order to show what those look like. But um, I think in general, uh, timing, structure, meaning, and what I'm talking about is the repayment over 20 years level debt service, um, that you should, and roughly this, a similar amount of borrowing uh, should produce a similar result in terms of economic cost. Okay, and I guess it's not anything that if you're financing something that's a major repair, where it's it's upgrading accessibility, is it's not that the bond market will treat that money differently than not at um, all. Yeah, so it's. Pretty, it's I'm sorry. It's pretty, yeah, so it's pretty much the timing, and I and when you said if we want to see others, that was left in the memo that if the finance committee asks for it, you could do something else. So I don't know whether, you know, it'll be the committee deciding whether we want to, but, you know, I just looked at the repair option two, which was specced out as to being two, pay, two phases, 14.4, but it was because the second phase had inflation. And if you did it all at once, 
you know, closed the building and just did it all at once, you could, instead of doing two debt issuances, you could do one because it would be at the same, in the same time period. Right. So, you, okay. That, so that to was- your point, uh, the, you know, the security of the borrowing is the taxes that are raised by the towns. I don't think that the, t- the town would, the bond market would not distinguish between a new construction project and a re- renovation. Um, okay. That doesn't make a difference here. Okay, thank you very much. Bob uh, Hegner. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. The first question I think is in the renovation in addition to option 2B, I think the total is wrong. <laughs> I think it's doubled or approximately doubled. You got like a $42 million total there, which doesn't seem right. That's, that's total, if I might, that's total debt service. That includes uh, principal interest. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, sorry, the grand total on that one is, is, um, is, is doubled up. Yeah, it's adding it twice, you're right. Well, the- yeah. We'll we'll the, fix it, uh, okay, I crop, beg your pardon. We'll crop that out for you, Bob. I'm sorry no, about that. No problem. No, and no, I just wanted to, to reassure myself on that. And I guess the other question I have is you've assumed a 20 year uh, bond or a 20 year borrowing period. It, are there other options like 25 or 30? Obviously, you pay maybe a higher interest rate and you, you know, carry more interest over that. But if cash flow, on a given year was a problem, that would be a way to stretch the, the, the debt out. Maybe yeah, I'll- I, I, I could speak to that one a little bit. Um, so David's provided, when we started working on all these projects, David um, is really good at giving us multiple versions of it. So um, you can do different terms, you can do um, level debt versus level principal. Um, for the option that we presented a finance committee or the plan that we presented a finance committee, we decided to go with 20 years. Um, because when I looked at it, you know, the trade-off and the annual payment for 20 years versus a 30 year, um, Mm -hmm. it was a, you know, relatively small savings on a per year basis, but you paid a lot more for that 30, 30 years. So, you know, I think for all these projects, if we can get them down to 20 years, you know, because of favorable interest rates and, and try to stay within our, you know, our, what we're budgeting, um, that would be my preference to keep our debt running. You know, one of the things our credit rating agencies look at, and David can speak to this a little bit, is, um, you know, how much of our debt obligation is left to be paid. And so the longer you stretch out your debt obligation, sort of the smaller portion of your debt, overall debt you've paid off. Um, but you're right, we could look at a 30 year option if we were trying to get things down a little bit. Um, that, that's an option we could explore more. And I think we have, I think that is one that we've already looked at. So we have it available. Yeah, I think, I think you know, if, if 20 years makes sense, then, then I'm fine with that. You know, I, I just wanted to make sure that we had looked at that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Question, Andy, and I don't think I can raise my hand. Okay, go ahead then, Lynn. <laughs> um, it, uh, Sean and, and David, can I also assume that at any point in time we can refinance the debt? Um, a standard approach to refinancing is that the, um, the bonds generally get become refinanceable after the seventh anniversary. So uh, if you issue in uh, December of 21, probably somewhere around 2028 or 2029, the bonds would be redeemable. And that's a pretty standard feature of the municipal bond market. Okay, thank you for that. So I guess I have a question for Kathy, just to understand, because I, I was trying to see what was behind what she was um, asking. So Kathy, were you suggesting a uh, essentially a third repair option? Yeah, uh, let me just, am I unmuted still? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Yes, yeah, so if you, if you look at what, um, what has been priced here, you go out for a uh, long-term, you've got to, he's got to scroll down to the repair option too. But the way it was, without, the way it was set up is you first went out for $12 million and then you waited two years later to go out for another 2.2 million. Oops, this is the one right here. 
Um, so you can scroll it down just a little up so you can see the two. So you're not going out for that second amount, Andy, until 2024. And as a result of that, you're paying a higher interest rate. So you can't quite see it on this screen, but I've got it up. So it's 3% if we're not financing it till 2024. If you said we're going to just do it all in one, um, go out in 2022 for the 14 million and some odd change, we save a little bit on inflation, then you can get that favorable interest rate by getting all the money in the one issuance. So that's just what I was looking at, um, the difference, because it's a 0.5% higher by waiting for two more years. And I looked at what, what Kuhn Riddle had in phase two for this option. It's, it's called external. So it's, it's going on on the outside of the building and the rest is you know the elevator and major systems inside. So it didn't seem to me any reason other than spreading town's costs for not doing it all at one, the way renovation and repair isn't saying do part of it now and then do part of it later. So that was just my question of putting that 2 million back up into the first line of government bonds. So it would be more like 14 million financed at two and a half percent. It lowers, you, you know, as you, you can imagine, it's gonna lower the total cost of it by, I, I did a rough back of the envelope thing, but it will lower the total cost of repaying this debt purely because we're not incurring that 3% interest rate. I, I'm, I'm confused because I'm trying to understand, Kathy, what the difference is between that and the option where they did, we only left the building one time. I mean, they, they provide this, two repair options. Yes, but this is that option, Lynn. Option two is the option where we only close the building once. But this second phase, that $2 million, $2.2 .2 million that you see on this line, yes. is uh, they, had, they had suggested that we do that two years later and it's the external part of the building. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the building is closed during that $12 million phase and then you come back. So I thought because the interest rate is so much higher two years later, you know, I think they were asked to spread it out, but here, if we wanted to do this, we might not want to do it twice instead of just raise all the money and do everything in the 12 months the building is closed. Thank you. Yeah, we can, uh, of course, when we come back in a moment, we can uh, ask Elon whether that's a uh, feasible from the work that she did. Uh, but, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about doing all the work at once and not um, not done in two chunks, because if uh, that's correct, if, since he, since borrowing, you're you're not proposing that we borrow for later construction. Which that's is what correct. I that's exactly right, Andy. So instead of you know finance the whole thing um, and do as much of what was in phase two on this. You know, I have theirs in phase two was a lot of external work on the building. They did, they closed the building to do all the internal work and then came back and did some external furnishing. So it seemed physically feasible to do this and that it's an advantage to finance it this way purely because of the interest rates. Otherwise it would spread out the cost better for the town. I. I Eileen, Aileen, Aileen is here, and I wonder if we want to just quickly ask her whether that is even feasible. It, it yeah. is feasible to do all the work at once, and it was spread out just for that reason, to spread out the cost so that you wouldn't have to put as much money up front. But it, you could do the entire project all at once. It might be a little bit longer than, than 12 months. So there's a little, there might be a little additional cost in terms of rental for the library. But um, yeah, it's possible to do all the work at once. Okay. And, and I guess on the flip side, there might be some savings because the contractor is only mobilizing once. Thank you. Well, thank you. So, so uh, yeah. are there other? Go ahead. Sorry, so I was gonna say, I, I think that addressed pretty much all the questions. There were a couple, you know, even the ones that were below the charts, there was, um, you know, there were some on the, the bans, but I think they, I don't know if David touched on it, but if you see the word ban in any of the schedules, it's a bond anticipation note, which means it's a temporary borrowing um, and would be converted to a bond or 
or uh, discharged later on. Um, and then there was a question about, you know, why some interest rates are higher and it has to do with the timing and that the farther away the borrowing occurs, the more conservative our interest rates, our interest rate estimates are. Um, and I think that addresses just about everything. So the question I would have is if the committee does want us to go back um, and I can work with David to run that option, if that's what the committee wants us to do. I think you should run that option and also um, just for the sake of discussion, run um, one, or, one of each of the options that go out to 30 years to just give some people some sense of the difference be, between 20 and 30. Is there anybody on the committee who disagrees with uh, Lynn's recommendation for those two additional option requests? And then um, and Alex, did you have something? Your hand was up momentarily. I, I was just going to say that um, I don't know. I don't know. I remember off the top of my head, but um, the KRA proposal and Elon can speak to this further is more of a schematic design. So it's, we're not going to have shovel in the ground 2021. Um, which may not affect your financing, but we, we have a similar six month to year lead time that we have on this proposal on the um, renovation expansion in terms of when you'd be able to start the project. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear for when you are um, uh, doing your options. And, and I, would, I would just chime in that it's not even schematic design. It's really conceptual. There, there are actually no drawings at all. It's all you know, ideas about the scope of work based on visual observations. So um, the expansion project is much more detailed in terms of the uh, amount of information about the potential project. So yes, it will take time for us to put the documents together before you would be shovel ready. Can I ask a question of Eileen while we're on this topic? Sure. Okay, so Eileen, you, you keep referring to this as an accessibility study. And I keep thinking, thinking it of as a major systems repair study and because of the cost, it trips accessibility. Is That's there... correct. So um, the Jones Library had a systems evaluation done by Western builders and right. they looked at all the systems within the building what they were not able to do was look at what the accessibility requirements would be because that's really what an architect does. Um, and so based on the value of the repairs required, it triggers uh, by code accessibility upgrades. So our study KRA was only focused on what the accessibility upgrades would be. Is that helpful? That, that's helpful. I just want to make sure that people understand that the systems are the issue uh, here. And it is because those systems have, are near failure um, that it has triggered accessibility because of the cost of replacing those systems. That's all I want. I, it's a general understanding. I want people to make sure they, they have, okay? And as a result, and nothing happens to the building other than uh, repairing the systems which were identified by Western builders and the necessary accessibility that flows from that. Um, nothing else is done to the building. Right. Okay. So are there any other questions or comments on this section? because um, I know that David is, has to leave and that's why we were doing it in this order. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do is I said that I was gonna do two periods for public comment. This is actually a very limited one, but if there's any members of the public who um, want to um, ask any questions um, at this point or make any comments, regarding what we have discussed in the financing options. 
Um, all other issues will be public comment after we have further presentation. But I, if um, if it requires uh, uh, David's presence, I wanted to get it. Hilda Greenbaum, I see your hand is up on this topic. Yeah, I think you answered it, but I wasn't quite sure. The column that says grand total that ends with 42 million of that is an error, so that the total financing is only 19.8 million. Is that correct? That seems the to be cost correct. of the project will, is nine. What? We will, yeah, that in, including uh, principal and interest, and we will provide a corrected sheet. But 19.8 yeah, is correct. It's uh, um, so it's 19.8. Um, whatever the number was i thought it was yeah it's the thing. it's the it's the total in, in the total column five, not the grant yeah. yeah exactly yep no sorry about yeah. that we we fixed that we caught that for the presentation that was made during the um the library I, I presentation thought, yeah yeah i thought that somebody had asked that question before yeah. uh, that, that's what i wanted to ask because the numbers that had been touted around last fall were more like the 42 million number so yeah sorry it, it is not 42 million for the town share just to be clear yeah thank you so uh, Tony Cunningham is the other member of the public who raised hands. And Tony, do you have anything that you wanted to ask uh, on the subject? Uh, David is uh, still available for responding. Yeah, thank you. Um, just on what's, what Kathy Shane has asked for there, that cash flow that looks at doing the repair in one um, phase. Is it possible, David, to apply the same premium um, assumption that you apply to the expansion to that 14 million borrowing. So if, it, if, it's, if that repair option is the 14.4, is it possible to have that premium on that also to reduce the amount that would be repaid? Does that make sense? Uh, I could, you know, I could make a uh, a projection including a premium, but I don't think it would have a material effect on the uh, impact on the fiscal impact. Uh, if I, I would expect that we would be looking at still, uh, you know, given that timing, I would expect that uh, probably we would be looking at a uh, an effective cost somewhere in the in the range of the two and a half percent. And I don't think it, I don't think the result would be very different. I think that. The, the, the reason for including the premium uh, previously was just to let, lend a little bit of more realism, but it's uh, really just uh, um, what we're really after here is what is the cost of the financing to the town? And I think that, I think that probably we would say for a mid June, 2022 uh, financing that you would be looking at, I think we, I would, come up with, uh, even if there was a premium, the effective cost would still come in near that point and probably would not be a materially different projection. Andy, yep. Elon has her hand up too. I don't know if you, if I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to let people know that I um, have another meeting at three o'clock. So I also am limited on time. Okay. That's helpful to know, and I appreciate you being here. And um, as we get into the next topics, we may again change the order a little bit so that we can uh, um, deal with the. Uh, actually, it probably was the next one up anyway. Was the total cost of all three options, um, inflation overruns, and then get back into uh, project oversight and construction management next with that. Lynn, do you agree that that would make sense? Yeah, and since Collier's is involved in both of those, these two really go together. Okay, so um, I think that uh, if, if there are no other questions from um, anybody who's uh, present, uh, particularly from the committee regarding um, the financing, uh, options that we've discussed already. Uh, I want to thank David. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate all your participation and your help. Um, Sean, did you have anything else that you want to um, say on the subject? 
Uh, no, we'll be able to I'll work with David and we'll get the committee that information um, in advance of your next meeting so you can uh, factor that into your discussion. And thank you, David, for helping us out today. Thank you. Take care now. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Lynn, I guess that um, you need to help us cue back to the questions where any answers that we have so far. And I think that what we had decided just a moment ago was to go to um, what's now section three, total costs of all three options, um, inflation and uh, um, so that we, if there are questions come up about the repair cost estimates, we can handle those uh, now with uh, on all of the participants present. So um, when you get us back to those questions, we'll... Then you're just trying to get us there, I assume. You're muted, so I'm not hearing what you're saying, but there we go, thank you. But I, let me just mention, I also believe Colliers wanted to share some slides at some point here too. Okay, but Sean, you made you did the major development of this, I believe. Um, so I no, this was mostly Sharon, but I can just do a quick introduction. Um, and I don't know if Alex or anybody wants to lead through the rest of it, but um, this was mostly compiled by Sharon. Okay, I, she's not able to be with us today, as you know. So. Alex, do you um, do you want to lead through this, or do you want me to try to? Either way. I mean, this is mostly just cut and paste from the other document with Colliers to fill in the, the gaps. So I don't know that there's a whole lot here to go through. Um, you know, I know, I know my questions are more on the new table we have on total costs and then a couple of the answers on the repair option. That's Kathy speaking. So so Lynn, maybe we should just go to questions while the um, OPM and the architects are here. And then we can go through if anything's not addressed in the questions. That sounds fine. Do you want me to show the questions or? Uh, I, and I was gonna see if anybody, um, Kathy said she I had some said. questions. So I didn't, if she wanted to ask them, yeah. Yeah. Yes, so, sorry, I just blurted in. I was just thinking that we didn't have to go over things if we didn't have questions. Um, Lynn. It, Aileen had said that she has to leave. So I don't know whether, well, I'll, I'll ask my questions on the big table you just showed. Um, I'm t I, as you know, the new table we have has some lines um, darkened out. And I have, a, I have a few questions, but just starting with a, a, an overarching question, I'm trying to understand what contingency is built into the 336.3 million. And so when I did try to compute the blackened outline that's down at the bottom of that chart, um, I took the total and then I subtracted this, the components of it um, to say what slept over and I got a dollar amount and then divided it and it looked like it was just 6%. So. Is there a contingency on construction that is built into the construction number and is not on that bottom line? Um, I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of what that dollar amount is and what the percentage amount is. That's my first question. So I can, I can answer that through the chair. Uh, so typically um, for, a, for a cost estimate at this phase of the project, there is typically what's called design and pricing contingency carried in those numbers, uh, which is basically the estimator saying, listen, we haven't had enough time 
to fully design this building. So we know there's gonna be approximately this amount of dollar value that still needs to be designed into this project. That's carried within the estimate, which is carried in the construction numbers on the top part of this sheet. Okay, so that's, like, so just, so that's in the fantasy report. So that's where I found a line item for that. Yes, that should be a three, there's a $3 million uh, design contingency in that, in his number. And does that contingency, if you, I just need to understand what the contingency covers. So if, if you bid out the construction at the estimated cost, and then uh, they open up the walls of all, old Jones and, or open up the floors and discover things they didn't anticipate. Does that incur a cost overrun? And is that what the other contingency is? Or does that 10% cover a, constru a construction? Cons Am I, I'm asking it in a, a way that's clear. Oh, well, the design contingency, I think that he's carrying up, up, up in the design should almost go to zero, you know, by the time the drawings are complete and we go to bid and the number comes in correctly, then the design is over. The construction contingency, I think, Ken, you're carrying that in your numbers, right? Correct. So at the bottom of this form, there's it, it's redacted because we purposely don't like to put that out to the public because then contractors can see how much additional right. funds are available for changes. Um, so we typically put that at the bottom and that's a construction contingency. Typically we carry between three and 5% for both construction contingency and owner's project contingency. Owner's project contingency are for soft costs, for betterments and things of that nature. The construction contingency would be the number that we would, we would attach any sort of changes to the work in the construction phase of the project. And is that a contingency also for, um, or, you know, I'm look, I went back and looked at the original grant proposal, but it had contingency on architectural fees on, on furniture. So is this an overarching contingency on everything? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's two key contingencies here that we know, construction and owner's project. Construction is your hard costs, owner's project are your soft costs. So all the soft costs, which would be your designer fees, OPM fees, any changes to testing, anything of that nature, uh, ff &E, that would all be borne by the owner's project contingency, not the construction contingency. Okay, construction so that, contingency is strictly for hard costs. So that is all in that, I mean, as I said, I can compute what the number is by subtracting everything off the 36, but it looks like it's around 6%. So that is more or less what you put into this? Okay. Cor correct, and Kathy, I would be more than happy to actually bring up the Excel document and walk you through it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I just don't wanna put that out to the public for, for various reasons. Okay, and then my other, I'll just go to my other major question. Mm -hmm. I saw you done inflation, you know, escalation up to 2022 on construction. It took me, I had to go back and forth a couple of times with the fantasy, sure. but it didn't look like you'd put any escalation on fees or on uh, furnish, furnishing at all. And in the original grant, there was an escalation factor on there. Is there a reason? And some of those numbers are quite a bit lower. The furnishing number dropped from the original. So it's a lower number, but without escalation. So I'm curious as, as to why. Sure, I'll, I'll answer that as well. Uh, a couple of things to note. So as you look at this form before you, this is actually an Excel document that's been created over years of scar tissue. So the numbers that are noted in black are typically uneditable formulaic numbers, all right? Um, we can overwrite them, but for the, for the most part, those are all formulas. So as we start to escalate the construction number, we don't put necessarily an escalation on fees and OPM fees and architect's fees, because those are all a product of a percentage of the construction. So as the construction escalates, the OPM fees and the architect's fees and everything else that's formulaic automatically escalates as well. So that's why there's not a separate line item for escalation for soft costs noted in here. The MBLC has us break that out, but quite honestly, the MBLC's form is secondary to our budget form. Our budget form is created first, and then we have to try to fit our numbers into the MBLC form to make it work. However, it doesn't do anything to your ineligible versus eligible costs. Those remain the same and consistent throughout both forms. So it doesn't really impact, it doesn't impact your grant at all. 
It's strictly how we place our numbers compared to how the MBLC looks at the numbers. As you can see from our form, it is much more thorough, a lot more line items. Again, because of all the things we've seen in the past, we wanna make sure we're, we're capturing all the costs. The MBLC form is, is nowhere near that, that, uh, that thorough. Okay, and my last question, I wanna turn it over to other people, is does the, I, I got a copy of the fantasy estimates um, that were for the redesigned project 2020, but I think that was before a lot of the energy work that was done. And I can see in this, we've got two line items that are similar to, are the same as what you showed during the council presentation um, for the timber, but does the basic construction have um, systems kinds of things like the, the heating systems, insulation and glazing, is all of that already in? Um, because some of those were going on at the same time Hennessy was doing them. Are the, is that already in their numbers? So the line items that were presented as far as the ECMs, the approved ECMs that we're, that we're talking about, those are uh, carried up above in a line item called ECM. Uh, the ECMs and the ad alternate, the ad alternate is the timber framing both of those combined equates to about $656,000 worth of uh, additional work, which is the difference between the 36.27 million and the 35.623 uh, million. Okay, I'm, I will, Andy, that, those are my major questions. Um, most of the others related to me trying to recompute some of these costs and crosswalk them to the other document that we had. Yeah, and then you'll have to decide whether you want to try and do that in the public meeting or you want to take uh, Ken's offer uh, walking through. I would take his offer. You know, I tried to, I tried to, you know, as an example, Ken, I tried to take the, um, the escalated cost per square footage times gross square footage to get to a sum. And it wasn't exactly the same sum you had, but it looked like you'd done something a little bit different, but it did match the fantasy numbers. So I was like looking at multiple documents. So I think my biggest question was about where the contingency fees are and sure. how much, and it goes with how much is the town protected since uh, we're gonna pay the remainder unless we drain the endowment fund um, from, sure from the cost not going higher than 36.3. Um, yeah, so that's the main one. I want to just know what's built in for, um, I think of it as wiggle room, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Yes, yep. Okay, is there anybody else who has questions at this point on the topic of costs of the three projects, the estimates for the three projects? Eileen was raising her hand. Aileen, I'm sorry. I think she was just leaving. Oh, three o'clock. that's right. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, can I just say that um, I know that Colliers has a, a couple of slides they wanted to share with people. Would you like to go ahead and do that? Because I think it deals with the whole issue of cost containment and project management. I, I can definitely share um, the, the slides that I was going to provide. They're, they're strictly um, to answer Kathy's questions, in which I, I think I've done already, but I'll, I'll go through some of the, um, the steps that we had to take in order to get to where we are today with the numbers, and I think that might be that proved helpful to the rest of the um, rest of the individuals on the call. I think that's very uh, useful for the general public, and remember, we're recording and broadcasting. Sure. So uh, at the beginning of the project, which is again, way back in 2015, as when we came on board, we developed what we call a high low probable budget. Uh, that's based on historical knowledge, the type of building that the, uh, the trustees wanted to build, as well as the size of the building that they were looking to build. So that high low probable was then informed in 2016 by the first fantasy estimate. The first fantasy estimate was incorporated into our budget analysis that you see here before you in, in the uh, end of October 2016. And again, the blue uh, um, numbers that you see here are the numbers that are uh, that we edit um, within the document. So uh, the, the dollars per square foot, current dollars per square foot in that fantasy contract uh, estimate are noted here. The square footage are, again are noted here. And then all the lines, subsequent lines down the line are then um, 
uh, either, either uh, a formula or again, the related construction is input through Fennessy's cost estimate and so on and so forth as we go down the line. This first 2016 uh, uh, budget analysis, which was in, then incorporated into the grant was predicated on understanding that we're looking at escalation to 2019, which is again, something that the MBLC requires. Uh, and so that's why these numbers were included in here for the, what they call inflation in the form, but it's, it's, it's escalation and that's been tracking at about 4% year over year escalation, which is what this, um, this form shows. Once this form was completed, we then work on the MBLC grant um, analysis form, which shows up here. It's going to take a second to just load up. So there is a form that the MBLC requires us to, to fill out, which um, basically shows the eligible versus ineligible costs, which would be the 35623 versus the uh, 32265. Uh, and those costs are then um, added into this form to produce what the MBLC's, um, what the MBLC share is gonna be. Let me just, I just gotta pull this real quick. Sorry about that, technology problems. While you're doing that, I wanna uh, clarify that MBLC does not pay for sustainability. Is that correct? That's correct. There's several things that the MBLC will not pay for. However, at the end of the project, um, and I'll show you this in this next form, at the end of the project, they do offer um, some uh, incentives for the um, whatever certification you get, whatever the sustainability goals might have been, mm -hmm. and they will um, they will give you a dollar value based on that. And as soon as I pull this thing up, I will show you exactly what I mean. I apologize, I lost internet here for a second. I'm, I'm gonna pipe in um, just on that note because um, the MBLC is tied only to LEED certification. Um, our building is beyond LEED certification and the sustainability committee discussed if the expense of becoming LEED certified was a worthwhile expense. And ultimately the decision was, we, we know we're doing better and paying to have somebody come in and certify that we're meeting lead certification didn't make sense. So that was just sort of chasing money from the MBLC that the sustainability committee ultimately didn't think was worth chasing because it's not offsetting the cost of sustainability, just getting a certification. It's, uh, the certification can be upwards of $100,000 easily for a major project. So. That's a um, choice that increasingly companies are making. Not That's correct. Lead, right. So they offer an incentive, but it's only based on a lead certification is what you're saying. Yeah. And I, I actually recently followed up with the MBLC to see if given that lead was really cool a couple of years ago, but, but buildings are really moving beyond that um, and was told they're not there yet. They're still tied to just lead certification. So unfortunately, um, that's still where they are relative to reimbursing for any certification. Thank you. Uh, okay, I, I can, it's coming up right now. And, and then Dorothy has her hand up. I see that Dorothy has her hand up, but uh, if Ken found his form, then Dorothy, I'll come back to you in just a moment. Okay, so I'm assuming everybody can hopefully see this. Yes. So this is the form that basically outlines what the grant, uh, at the grant award will be for a project over $15 million. This is something that uh, we work with the MBLC to, to finalize this form. And as you can see here, um, it shows the 35623, which is our total project cost, the 32265, which is the uh, estimated eligible project costs, and then the grant award is based on a sliding scale, as you can see here. So it starts at 3 million at 60%, then it goes between 3 million and 6 million at 45. And you can see those calculations here on the right. 
to give you 11.9 million. And then there is a need factor of 14.53%. The maximum the MBLC will allow is 15%. This is a socioeconomic to us to, uh, to make this uh, the, the formula work for the uh, overall grant. And that was 14.53, which gets us the 13.663 million for the potential grant award. So that's how that, um, that total project budget ends up becoming the uh, estimated eligible uh, award by the MBLC. That was the second step. Then the third step would be to, to get us to go into the, the MBLC spreadsheet and break our costs into the typical boxes that the MBLC wants to see them in. Again, we have a long list that ends up getting broken down to a very, a very short truncated list that the MBLC requires. Um, so that ends up becoming part of that grant application as well that was submitted in January of 2017. These numbers, unfortunately, are, are a point in time that they uh, are not able to be adjusted now. So this is the budget that we have to work towards and work against. So that's why uh, the only thing that we were able to adjust uh, after the latest fantasy uh, cost estimate, um, we had to do that within the current budget and not adjust the budget, make the budget 38 million or 39 million or whatever that needed to be with the new construction cost. Uh, and we ended up having to do it within the overall budget, which is, uh, which is why you see uh, the number only changing the 656,000 for the ECM and the uh, ad alternate for the timber framing. Any questions? Good. Dorothy, your hand is up, so I wanted to get to you next. Okay. Uh, I think I misunderstood your discussion about the LEED certification. Um, did you say that it cost money in order to get the LEED certification and that you might it would cost you $100,000? That's correct. Uh, I guess I, I would love a little explanation on that because that sounds kind of wild. Uh, yeah, it's just a historic fact. Um, unfortunately, there's just so much paperwork uh, to, that, that, uh, that's uh, labor intensive to, to get the certification process that historically it ends up being about six figures uh, for a project this size to be certified. And then what do you get for that besides feeling good about yourself? <laughs> a plaque. A plaque. Okay. So I can see you saying, let's skip that step. We're going to a further, further level yes. of energy saving. Good. Thank you. That's right. And we see a lot of our clients doing that nowadays. They want the benefits of LEED without the certification. Lynn, did you have a question? Yes. So I just want to be very, very clear. The bottom line is the bottom line we see now. Unless somebody not the town council, not the library trustees, not anybody else says we want to do something else. This is the bottom line. And whatever other changes want to be made, this is the bottom line. That's correct. This budget is, is, is locked in time, especially with the MBLC. The grant award will not change. So this is the budget that we are dealing with right now. Okay. So even if inflation happens because of the cost, cost of steel, or whatever else may happen. This is the budget we have to live with. That's correct. That's why those contingencies are there to be able to absorb those costs. I want people to hear that loud and clear because the word inflation, while useful, is not the issue here. We're done. This is the budget. This is the bottom line. You build to the budget. You don't go beyond it. It's not a blank check. Yeah, that's absolutely correct, which is why I said when, when we uh, sent in the application to the MBLC, that's when we locked in that budget. And that budget has not changed. It will not go up or down based on any sort of outside influence. Kathy has her hand up, Andy. Yeah, I didn't know if you had anything else, Lynn, otherwise I was going to call on no, Kathy. I'm okay, Kathy. I just want to build on what you said, Lynn. I do understand that, that that's the cap here. Um, so what, why I was asking about contingency is if when we actually go out to bid and then when you go ahead into building, we find between those two things, uh-oh, you know, we, 
uh, things are not as we had hoped they would be, you know, because you haven't. So I know um, one of you, when you presented on Monday night a while ago to the council, said you could value engineer, you could get back down to the total. What I'm, what I'm worried about, or what I want to know, is there a point at which, if those estimates now bids come in, and they are higher than what we had hoped they would be beyond, you know, the the wiggle room you've got in contingency, to be confident that we don't cut something out that you built into this building that will give it that 50 years life that we were expected. And my understanding of 1993 from some people who talked to me about it is it was value engineered down for some things. You know, I don't know exactly what, but I wouldn't want us to stay within budget and give up something we really want. Um, um, I'm sure nobody wants that. So I've also been wondering about the soft costs, you know, whether there's furniture or the automatic books. So is there some place where the actual building comes in somewhat higher than we hoped? Is there something else that could be given up and still bring the building home without going over the total, without hurting the integrity of the building itself? So, you know, the furniture costs all, already went down. That number went down quite a bit from what was in the original document. You know, so, so that's, that's what I'm looking for. I, I know that's what the OPM is supposed to help everybody be doing with this. Um, but it's, and, and it's, when would you know that? And if we got to a point where we said, whoa, we, we were really off before uh, the money starts flowing from the grant and the everything, would we know that within, you know, a month of getting bids on construction, like we're, we're you know, it, what's the timing on when we might know that the best guess was off? I'd be happy if the best guess was off on the, it's cheaper than we thought. That would be great, right? <laughs> and that happens sometimes, believe it or not. <laughs> no, I could see it. And, but, and I saw one town recently in their thing, they said when they actually went out to bid, it came in lower than they thought. So I, I realize it does happen. And yeah. that would that would be a gift to everybody, right? Um, so what kind of, when in the process do we know that before we start putting, you know, a shovel in the ground or whatever we want to say, you know? Sure. Can, yeah. Yeah, no, I understood. And, and so there's several things that are going to happen between now and even when this project goes out to bid. And I, I think I mentioned them previously at the town council meeting. There's still at least two more times that this project is going to be estimated uh, prior to moving into the next phase of the design process. Uh, there's still a lot of design that still needs to happen. We're going to know at the end of design development, uh, which is the next phase of design, what our assumptions were in the previous phase and how those are shaking out for the coming phase, which is construction document phase, which is the final design phase before going out on the street. Um, we're gonna make sure that we're gonna look at not just, and I hate the, I hate the phrase value engineering because it's really value management that we're looking to try to do. <laughs> we're looking to ensure that this project is gonna be a, a project after bid day uh, so we're going to look at different alternates. If there's add alternates that can be easily uh, delineated within the contract documents to ensure that we have a viable project uh, once this project is, is bid out. Um, I will say that historically, uh, we have been extremely successful in getting projects um, uh, to, to be better than um, we had estimated. Uh, Cape Cod Tech was 10% below our estimate. Um, Gardner Elementary School, below our estimate, West Springfield High School. Again, these are, and these were, West Springfield High School happened to be uh, during the the, uh, the Great Recession. So, you know, there is uh, opportunities here that we're gonna look to try to capitalize on and uh, things to build on and make sure that we've got a, a very, very successful chance of, of, uh, of a bid value um, within budget come bid day. Thank I'd you. like to reinforce that. I think this, the estimates that will come in the next phase Really, if we do the design developments starting, you know, fairly shortly, you know, within probably seven months, we would know where we are confirming or changing or struggling with our schematic budget. And Ken will be doing another budget. We will have Fennessy doing an updated budget and then we reconcile them. So we have two estimates to be reconciled, but the design development again at construction documents. And I agree with Ken, we've been successful when we get to the construction documents and we look, we still think we might have trouble because who can control all the markets, et cetera. 
introducing some alternatives, you know, where we, they're all, you know, level of windows, which would serve the project. And we're sticking, sticking with the highest level, their intermediate levels, which would also be maybe something we want to look at. Like we have all wood window replacements in the existing building, which is what we want. They could be done in aluminum and match the profiles, et cetera. So I think we have things like that we will look at for you. Okay. I see no hands from the committee as of right now. And uh, question, uh, Linda, were there questions that we had on that sheet? Uh, back to the uh, major question and answer sheet on project oversight and construction management that we ought to get back to since it's closely related to what we've been talking about. Andy, I just want to interrupt and let you know that um, Doug Kelleher from Epsilon, who's the Mass Historic um, Tax Credit Consultant, has a 3.30 meeting. So okay. if we can table the questions around Mass Historic the 30th, um, because I don't think we're going to be able to <laughs> get him in in the next five, 10 minutes or seven minutes. Unless, um, I don't know if Doug's left the meeting yet. If there's one pressing question people want to ask, but I just want to let you know. I have to check to see if he's still here to answer that question while Lynn is. I, I think he's, I think he's gone. I think he left too. So we will All right. duly noted. Thank you that we're going to have to take that um, up later. And um, These are the questions that came under project oversight and construction management. So we're, the, I guess the, uh, I don't want to go through a reading exercise because I know that um, these have been out there for the committee to review and read. So the, um, what I'm looking for is whether there are any follow-up questions on this category or comments um, that members of the committee have about the general question of uh, the, the project is and how it's managed. While we're looking at that, I just wanna be very, very clear that while I put a few page numbers and filled in a, a couple of questions and did organize the original questions, Alex and Sean and other trustees, Bob included, spent the mass, vast majority of the time providing these questions, answers to these questions. Enormous numbers of hours have been put into them. So I don't know, um, Andy, this is Sean, sorry. I don't know, maybe it would be a good question for Ken to talk about, um, I know there was one question about how this project will be managed, whether it's a design bid build or a construction manager. Does it make sense for Ken to give a little breakdown of what each of those is and um, you know, what are the assumptions right now? Sure, thank you for the suggestion, John. Sure, so the assumptions for this project uh, would be a Chapter 149, Mass General Law, Chapter 149, Design Bid Build. Um, they are typically your, your standard general contractor type of project. You have to go through all the requirements of Mass General Law with pre-qualification and filed sub-bid you know, contractors, et cetera. It's a different management for 149A, which is construction manager at risk, which is a little bit different, um, a little bit more... Um, uh, they, they tend to have more allowances. They allow you to be a little bit more flexible with your um, with your phasing of the projects. You typically see a CM at risk, construction manager at risk project when uh, it would be a um, renovation, occupied renovation project where you would need to have that uh, ability to be flexible um, with regarding public safety and temporary construction and things of that nature. It's typically more expensive to do a CM at risk uh, because of that extended oversight and those um, that flexibility. 
Uh, historically, it's about 10 to 15% more expensive going to CM at risk. And because this project is uh, going to be an unoccupied uh, addition renovation project, it just makes sense to go with a Chapter 149 uh, general contractor design bid build uh, process for this project. And that's what's been assumed in the budget. Andy, you're um you're muted, Andy. I don't know if you were calling on Kathy or somebody. Yeah, yeah sorry. I I had done that because my phone was ringing and I didn't want it to be ringing in the background. Alex, did you have something? Your hand is up. Okay, Kathy. Um, yeah, I'm just. It was the page Lynn just showed where it said town manager. So the. The, um, you described how you were going to go through your stages and to what extent is the town manager at the table, um, you, know, uh, you know, along this process, um, or Sean at the table or check backs to the town on, you know, I just wrote down seven months from now, you'll have a better idea of um, what these are. You know, it, it, this is gonna segue in not, as much to your management, but I know the trustees have, are putting the endowment up as one of our fallbacks. So there's another set of questions on that. But you know, will someone in the town that I'll stop there? It said town manager, you know, <laughs> next to that thing. So what does that mean that the town manager will at some, you know, on a building committee, you've already got your OPM? Um, that's my question. So um, I'll jump in. I think that question was about, you know, will there be a building committee for this project? And I think we left it open that, you know, the plan is for there to be a building committee. I don't know if the composition has been decided yet, um, who will be on that committee. Um, Ken, can you talk about the types of reports that we'll get once the project starts um, that tells us how the project is uh, faring compared to what the budget was? Absolutely. Uh, so Typically, what we'll provide the committee, um, we typically oversee our projects um, looking at cost, quality, and schedule from day one. Um, we ensure that the, the budget is being tracked with not only um, what has been contracted, but what is projected to be contracted, what your potential exposures are out there. That is all tracked on a very comprehensive cost spreadsheet analysis worksheet that we share with the building committee. It's updated um, in real time day in and day out. So it's available at a moment's notice for the community to be able to use. It's also online on our Collier's 360 platform. You'll be able to see where you're tracking as far as the budget is concerned. Uh, on, the, on the quality of the project, you're gonna have uh, oversight, daily oversight from one of our construction reps on the quality of the project, looking at the construction, doing daily refill reports, ensuring that uh, the, the, the construction is, is going per plans and specs that you all are getting what you pay for. Uh, and then that's gonna be presented to the building committee on a biweekly or monthly basis in the form of a, of a comprehensive monthly report, which will include all those daily reports uh, to give a historical tracking of, of where we're at. In addition, uh, I would assume and I would recommend that a member of that committee attend the weekly construction progress meetings so that they are fully up to speed with what's going on on site. Uh, that's the owner architect contractor meetings. Uh, and we typically like to see a member of the building committee there Again, just for that transparency and that clarity so that they understand where things are at, uh, not only in the field, but also financially and what we're seeing for potential issues out on site. Again, being proactive and projecting that out ahead of time so that the committee has an opportunity to be able to react to it uh, appropriately and not have to have it to have to be a, a fire drill every time we're meeting uh, on an issue that's projected out there. So there'll be a lot of paperwork that's gonna be going back and forth between our, our office and the committee. Uh, it's also can be done, uh, again, via a website as well. Uh, so they'll have all that information at their fingertips. Andy, can I ask one follow-up question to that? Yes. And, and Ken, can I just, uh, I assume too that those reports will um, track our progress towards meeting all the milestones for our grant payments um, to make sure that we get a, a grant payment every fiscal year? That's correct, yep. Not only, not only again, the, the, I, I didn't mention the third leg of that stool, I said cost quality, but the schedule is also a key component as well. And we're, we're constantly monitoring that schedule um, at every one of our uh, um, weekly job meetings, as well as, our, as well as daily when we're on site to ensure that the, the project is tracking the way the contractor had intended and that all of our milestones are being hit 
appropriately and we'll make sure that the MBLC is getting their paperwork timely to ensure that you're getting your grant payments. Thank you. So the question that I would have is what other kinds of changes might be identified as you're holding your weekly meetings that um, you or the architects might um, feel that you need to recommend back to a building committee and um, what are the consequences of those when they typically arise if they do? That's a great question. And, and it typically, it depends on the committee. There's, there's some committees that uh, authorize a, a financial subcommittee um, with a certain dollar threshold for incidental changes that might happen on site or even one committee member that uh, might have the authority to uh, say anything uh, below a $20,000 threshold to be able to make that change and then report back to the committee. Some committees wanna know about everything. We keep a very comprehensive log of not only changes that are happening, both credits and ads, but also things that are, again, projected to be out there that we're seeing that our construction rep might hear while he's out on site uh, about a pipe that was exposed that had additional asbestos on it that needs to be abated, something to that effect, something that wasn't originally caught uh, in the contract documents. Things happen on every single job site, which is why we just wanna make sure we're as proactive about these as possible and ensure that we're tracking those dollars accordingly. Um, but oftentimes, again, if, if, if there's a, a particular committee member that's more uh, hands-on in this uh, and during the OAC meetings and things of that nature, they would typically be on a, you know, very easy to reach by our, by our team to ensure that we're getting their eyes on things as they're happening immediately and not waiting till that next meeting or waiting to that next building committee meeting even to ensure that we're getting um, uh, oversight, proper oversight in addition to us. And, and when we get changes from contractors, uh, it's not just a rubber stamp. You know, we thoroughly vet those changes, ensure that we're being firm but fair. Um, if it is a cost that's associated with the project, we want to make sure that it wasn't already bought in the documents and that we've got a real cost associated with that project uh, change. Uh, if there's a credit that's due for some of the work that uh, should have been done um, in, in, in light of this change, we want to make sure that we're accounting for that as well, looking at all the, um, all the prevailing wage rates, ensuring that that's a comprehensive full cost that they can't come back uh, later on and, and add to it to make sure that we're, we're looking at that appropriately. Okay, other questions from the committee? I wanna make it clear that uh, we're coming back to public comment one more time after we've completed the last section. Uh, but at, at this point, I'm looking to the committee or to the trustees if they had, or, uh, have anything to add is the other section that we were definitely planning to cover today was any issues that um, people want to ask about relating to sustainability and timing. So I want to make sure that uh, we have uh, included time for that uh, discussion and presentation and while we our guests are with us. So um, Lynn, did you want to pull up those questions for a moment? Is that possible? Yep. <clears throat> Okay, so any 
any further questions that cover these topics? So if not, then I will go back to um, public comment for any additional public comment. Looking for hands from members of the committee. So um, people feel that the questions have been, their questions were adequately answered or um, within the written document. And I thank all of the people who provided the written document. Um, so Rudy Perkins, uh, who is one of our town experts on the subject, I'll bring you along. I don't know what your question is, if it's related to the sustainability piece or otherwise, but Rudy, well, welcome to the meeting and uh, please introduce yourself and uh, state, um, tell us what your comments or questions are. Um, Chairman Steinberg, can you hear me? I'm on a phone. Yes, I can. Okay, okay great. Uh, my question related to both uh, the budget and to sustainability. Um, it sounded like from Mr. Gayette that the two cost increases for sustainability issues were the ECMs that were added, those five ECMs, and the cross-laminated timber. Uh, those are called out as a separate um, increase item in the budget. But were there other things, those get us from the 34.4 EUI down to the 29 EUI. Were there other things that we needed to add to the project to get to the 34.4? For example, the VRF heating system, that didn't look like it was in the 2016 scope to me. Were there increases in installation? Um, did we do other air tightening of the building? Um, were there thermal bridging changes that were made? Because uh, some of those were called out in an April uh, 2020 memo. Um, uh, a file memo at uh, uh, Feingold Alexander, and it looked like they were recommending those as additional steps. So my question boils down to, did those get captured in the original 2016 budget or were they add-ons? And if so, what is the cost of all those other add-ons and why isn't that in this budget or is it? And where is it if it is? I, maybe, Thank you. Maybe I can start and Ken can finish. Uh, no, those were not in the 16 budget, but they were in the revised budget in I think May 2020, because we had had dialogue at that point about it, about the system. We had already gone to the non-gas uh, system. We changed to electric, um, and that system was reviewed by the engineer and information given to the um, the cost estimator. We uh, also, I think at that time, we were using the 2018 standards for insulation, which were admittedly lower than we'd like to be. And uh, we were still looking, when we go to the next phase, if we do, we're gonna look at a greater level of wall installation and, and insulation in the under slab. So, but there were upgrades made from the 2016 to the current estimate. And that does include, as far as I know, everything that we've done, except for the added ECMs, which Ken has made way for. I, I didn't see any reference in the 2020 fantasy estimate of a later document that included those May changes. Um, why wasn't that called out by them and what was that document and could you could someone could that be posted somewhere so we can take a look at what the additions were i'm not sure we specifically identified the cost of each of those additions because they were part of the overall re-estimate that was done at that time so the final drawings which were submitted to him in i guess in may had that in those instructions were just given to him by the engineers and by the sustainability report and the appendix. Okay, okay I'll take a look. Okay, thanks. Anything else, Rudy, that you wanted to ask? Is no, thank not? you. Okay, so thank you, Rudy. Um, so 
uh, there are two other people who I see have hands up. Tony uh, has um, bring you back in the room for a moment and um, you have Thank additional you. questions. Yeah, um, following up on what Councillor Shane asked about the escalation, um, can you point out where in the total budget analysis the three more years of escalation from July 2019 to March 2022 construction um, is shown? Because I don't see it. The numbers seem to have gone down from the July 2019 start to the March 2022 start as opposed to going up. Um, so that's the first question. And then secondly, the contingency. Um, in the MBLC uh, pro forma submitted in 2016, um, it had 11.5% for construction contingency and it had 10% for soft costs contingency. And it seems like now you have only 6% in this. Is that sufficient to cover construction contingency and soft costs? And I know in the fantasy estimate, they explicitly say construction contingency is not included in their figures. So I'm just wondering if that 6% is enough at this early stage to cover any overruns or unforeseen changes. Thank you. So I'll answer the first question, a uh, second question first. And I said, yes, that that is that 6%. The way the MBLC calculates their contingency is different than the way that our budget formula calculates the contingency, which is why there, you see the discrepancy there. Uh, but there is ample contingency contained within the budget to be able to um, um, accurately and, and uh, produce this project. Uh, for the first question, uh, the escalation is simple. Uh, we got a revised estimate from Fennessy in 2020. So we're only escalating those costs from that estimate to the 2022 date, uh, which would be approximately a year and a half um, for the uh, for that escalation, which is why that value is less than the original contemplated three years for the um, 2016 submission to the MBLC. If I may just follow up on that, um, where is the escalation on the soft costs? So like I answered before, the escalation is uh, formulaic. Uh, so the soft costs, excuse me, are formulaic. So as the construction costs go up and are escalated up, the uh, soft costs are, are uh, escalated up as well because they're a percentage of the construction costs. But they actually came down. Which soft costs are you referring to that came down? The furnishings. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, so in order to be able to make- the fees. So in order to be able to make the budget work within our constraints, we had to reduce certain, certain items down to account for the additional escalation that came into the project from this being a 2022 project now instead of a 2019 project. And I can share that if, if you'd like. It was $1.8 million worth of uh, adjustments to the overall budget to um, reduce the budget to, a, to ensure that we didn't go over the originally intended budget of $35 million. And do those changes on uh, furnishings uh, and equipment uh, satisfy the expectations of the library and bring us the um, project that we in the MVLC and the library anticipated? I, I, yeah, so this has been discussed with the trustees and I believe they uh, fully uh, understand the, the sacrifice that had to be made here. And we're going to work within that budget to ensure that the uh, proper uh, FF&E is included in the project. Alex, you had something? Yeah, two things. So um, I'm just going back to Rudy's question and I want to make sure that it's clear sort of the timeline. So um, the trustees went back to Feingold Alexander to request an updated schematic originally to change the location of the meeting room based on the MBLC's request. Um, when that process was begun, the sustainability committee came out with its recommendations. So we went back to Feingold Alexander and said, you're working on revised schematics. We want these uh, sustainability measures to be included in the updated schematics. So the schematics that we received from Feingold Alexander and the corresponding updated cost construction from Fennessy include coming up with a building that met that EUI of 34.4 and incorporated all of the changes requested by the sustainability committee 
so that we weren't looking at those 2016 designs from an energy perspective anymore. The ECMs were a way to get us down because our committee had asked for an EUI between 24 and 29. Um, and the building as presented with the Fennessy schematics and with or with the Fennessy um, cost estimates and the updated schematics didn't quite get us there. So there were the additional ECMs uh, that were also uh, costed out either by the uh, engineers or by Fennessy for the CLT to get us to that point. So I just wanna make sure people understand the timeline. We It wasn't like we got the updated schematic and then we went back and did the sustainability stuff. It was all, that was one of the primary reasons for going back to um, Feingold Alexander. Um, and then also um, some of the numbers I saw, Tony had some, um, questions in hers about the numbers that Collier has filled in. So again, because we went back and we paid additional funds to do the energy analysis and to do more design work than was traditionally in a schematic, that allowed us to fill in certain elements. So if you look at the MBLC grant, you'll see that there were certain parts around like site work and site prep and things like that that were blank. They were an all included number. And then if you go back and you compare the current fantasy to those certain same lines, you now see where they're actually filled in and those numbers correlate directly to the numbers in the fantasy. So that additional amount of work that the trustees paid for has allowed Colliers to have a better understanding of what our actual budget is, which removes some of the elements required in the contingency when you're making guesses at things. And the other point was, yes. So Sharon, the library director and I went line by line through every item. So we made a request of Colliers to pretend the sky is the limit, project out the budget as if we had no budget. It came out $1.8 million above. And then I said, great, <laughs> now, now go back and tell me what we would have to cut. And we went line by line through each cut and had a discussion about what made sense, what didn't make sense. And you know, could we still do it, right? So will we have top of the line furniture? Maybe not. Will it still be long lasting, high quality furniture? Absolutely. There are other elements in the budget, such as right now we have $500,000 for rental. If we are able to get a space in town where we don't have to use rent, that's $500,000 that goes back toward other costs. So there's, I personally am comfortable with the numbers that we went through. The library director is comfortable with the numbers that have, been, have, have gone through. And it was absolutely vetted where we would have to cut what it would look like. Thank you. Other questions from uh, or comments from the committee? If not, I wanted to go back to we're in public comments and there's one more person who wishes to join us. So Hilda, as soon as uh, you're in. So hi, Hilda. Hi, um, I got another question for you. This has to do with um, the bidding process because I don't remember all the details and it's a general question. Um, are we committed to taking the lowest bid or is there a way of checking out the work of the person's bid that we might possibly accept before you take them? I'm thinking in terms of the atrium, which has been a fiasco. Uh, it's leaked from the beginning and apparently to make a long story short, the contractor who built it went bankrupt and disappeared or whatever, so that the atrium was never fixed. How do we protect ourselves? Is it covered from insurance? Or how do you how do you pick if you have to take the lowest guy, can you also pick a guy that's gonna give you a really good job that'll last 50 years? That that's the one question. My other question and it is also an insurancy kind of thing. Is there somewhere in the budget that protects the library from liability to damage to the foundation of the strong or any damage to the strong house from vibrations during demolition and huge uh, dump trucks taking the stuff away that certainly will be shaking the earth a little bit. So those two things that have been on my mind. Uh, uh, can you own a try or? Sure, I can take those questions through the chair. Uh, so for the first question, uh, this, this project is going to go through a pre-qualification process for the general contractor and the subcontractors. 
So at any point in time, if there's a reason to disqualify a contractor, we will be able to do so at that time. Um, if, there, if we do get into a situation where there is an issue on site and the contractor goes belly up, there are performance and payments, payment bonds that are a requirement of Mass General Law to ensure that at that point in time, the bonding agent would come in and the bonding com company would come in and complete the project. As for the existing stronghouse and potential issues uh, with construction, we're gonna make sure again, by being on site, uh, as much as we're gonna be on site and having those conversations uh, with the stronghouse uh, faculty and, uh, and staff to make sure that we're keeping uh, accurate tabs on everything that's going on on site with, with regard to any sort of uh, drilling um, compaction, things of that nature. We're also gonna wanna make sure that we, along with our consultants do an accurate assessment of the existing conditions of that building to ensure that if there is something that goes wrong, that we've got uh, uh, an accurate assessment of what the project was like prior to um, the construction starting. Uh, and then we're gonna make sure that the contractor has, has the, the required requisite um, insurances required to, to make good on those repairs if needed. Well, it's the contractor responsible, not the town. That we, yeah, that's correct. There'll be, there'll be components written right into the contract documents about protection of adjacent properties. It's a, it's a standard practice, especially when you're around historic properties. Um, the strong house isn't the only property in immediate proximity to the, to the, strong, uh, the Jones Library. So in the contract documents, when the contractor is doing his bidding, there will be components referencing the adjacent properties and means to protect it. Uh, with respect to quality control, I just wanted to add, you know, as Ken mentioned earlier, um, Collier's is an OPM. We do a regular site inspection. We monitor the quality of work, but we're not the only ones out there also. Uh, the architects, Feingold Alexander, uh, they have their experts out on the site, making sure that the work is being uh, conducted in accordance with the contract documents, the performance requirements. So you actually have multiple sets of eyes watching what's happening out on the site. And this is above and beyond the contractor's own quality control. So you'll have a minimum of at least three sets of eyes watching the quality progress of the work um, to, to gather some insurances, assurances that it's being done properly so you don't have to rely on an insurance claim at a later date. The effort, the intent is to be proactive. Catch anything before it happens, track it, make sure it's fixed before we take before you take ownership of the project. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Hilda, if you had a piece to your question as to if the skylight problem in the 93 edition was not discovered until after the work was completed. I don't um, know, I don't know. Yeah, uh, what would happen? I, was, I, was, I don't know if that was part of your question, but I'll oh, add okay. it. Okay. I, I can answer that one as well through the chair. So as, as part of this project, one of our recommendations is going to be building envelope commissioning. Uh, so something, for instance, with the envelope of the building, it's going to be tested from by this commissioning agent to ensure um, that this is a, a um, well-designed, well-constructed building envelope to ensure that those issues that happened at the old building do not happen again in the future. Uh, and then there's a warranty period, obviously. Um, Part of our discussion with the design team and the trustees as we go forward in the building committee is what the duration of that warranty period wants to be. There may be some items that we want to look at potentially extending warranties on to ensure that something like that doesn't happen again. But those are some of the things that we're going to be talking about in the coming phases. Okay, thank you. So Hilda, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, that was helpful. Um, so Alex, did you have something you wanted to add to this. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add is that um, in the 1990s um, work, um, that was before OPMs were required. And I think, I think Ken and George are, are, are very much proving today why OPMs are invaluable. So just the, the very nature of the process has changed so that we are required by the MBLC to contract an OPM whose sole job it is, is to make sure that the building is built right. We come in on budget that everything, all the rules are being followed. And so there is a process built in now that assures that things go as they should. And the duty and the obligation of the OPM is to us, not to anyone else. And so I think that's a really 
important piece that has not existed in the past on these building projects. Okay, thank you. Dorothy, you had a question? Yes, um, I'd like a little bit more explanation. Um, several times in the papers, I read that if there is um, uh, more money needed um, on the library, that the cost would not then go to the town, but that the library would um, seek further fundraising, that this hasn't been formalized yet, but um, some kind of document is in the works, perhaps with a town manager. Um, to me, that certainly relieved some of the questions that many people have had, though I'm not quite sure how it works. So I'd, I'd like you to explain it, please. Andy, do you want me to start with that? Yeah, why don't you say start one? So um, literally, we have had a number of conversations and today we had yet another one, this time with KP Law, uh, to uh, outline the terms of the um, MOU that would be between the town and the uh, Jones Library, Inc. And that would define all of the issues with regard to the fundraising, the payment, uh, when the payments would be made, um, how we would monitor that on a regular basis, uh, including looking at their financial statements, their 990s, their uh, other federal doc, the federal tax forms, and um, also uh, the tax statements that they get for their um, uh, not trust fund, their uh, endowment. Um, so there would be it all be in an MOU that would be then, if possible, we're hoping to at least have the basic elements of that come before the finance committee next week, uh, not two weeks from now. And then that will be part of what the town council also would then agree to sign. So again, I want to just go back to MBLC is locked in to a certain amount of money they will give us. The town with its vote would be locked in to a certain amount of money that would come from the town. And the fundraising then locks in the library trustees, Inc., Jones Library trustees, Jones Library, Inc., to the remaining amount of money. And it would be over a five year period. And we still have some other details to work through on that, Dorothy. Uh, none of us wants to bankrupt the um, endowment and none of us wants to jeopardize the operating funds of the library. I have to tell you that I believe that Treasurer Bob Pam has done an excellent job of doing his analysis and coming forward with that. Uh, and we have another discussion that uh, I believe Austin plans to have with Kent with regard to cash flow that we might or might not be able to expect with regard to fundraising. But I want to be very clear the fundraising has a big balloon at the end because that is when the historic tax credits or any sustainability credits come in. But we're trying to make sure all of that is carefully laid out. We're also talking with the lawyer about how we protect the town's interest with regard mm -hmm. to the significant amount of money that will go into this. And um, then the other issue that will come up is who actually signs the contract, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And all of that is being done with, reg with legal counsel. Thank you very much. Okay. Kathy? Lynn, um, I'm glad you said that's going to come to us on March 30th, because I think the one, and then you added that we don't want to put, and I know endowment is a discussion next week, uh, in two weeks, you did it. Um, to the extent there's risk, I understand we're trying to cap the risk. But uh, as far as I know, we don't have trustees with very deep pockets in terms of their own personal assets. So we're not holding them personally liable. And so it, the, the question is, you know, what, this, what the security blanket is and what's in an MLU. So we're going to focus on, I, as I understood it, which is my endowment questions, next week on, you know, how much, uh, Bob's already answered it once, but I have some additional questions on, on this as well. 
you know, I understand every effort's going to be made. And Alex just assured us we're not opening a library with no furniture in it. We're just opening up, we're opening a library with more utilitarian furniture in it, which is, or maybe reusing some old furniture, which is also okay. Um, but, you know, what we wouldn't want to build a new building and come back to the town and say, oh, we forgot the furnishing. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's, there aren't that many pieces that, um, can be completely foregone if we reach uncertainty. So I do, I do want to, I worked for a foundation where the foundation had deep pockets and they could be liable for, for things, but we don't necessarily have that here. So that's next week, correct? It's two weeks, two weeks from now, from now yes. Now, although, two, in two weeks, in two weeks, okay. Two weeks from now, although we do have Bob Pam with us here, we have Kent Farber with here, here with us uh, and um, the historic tax credit I'm hoping he, the gentleman who's the consultant on that will be able to return in two weeks as well. But either Bob or Kent, or, I mean, I, Kathy, I really urge you to look over the answers to the questions that have already been raised and make sure we know what they are because right now the finance committee is scheduled to meet um, on the 30th and then this comes to the full council on the 5th. I, I did look over the answers and I wrote up some additional, you know, just focusing off those answers, but um, I can hold them for next next time we meet. Um, I just don't know how much. It's yeah. really up to the chair how he wants to handle that. Well, if we, we did reserve the subjects for uh, two weeks from now that uh, we're currently discussing and uh, to go back just to remind everybody the list for next uh, time, March 30th, as was put together in the document, includes uh, revisiting project oversight and construction management to the extent necessary, though I hope that um, on the duplicated, we don't have to do that. We will get into the questions of um, ownership of building, historic tax credits, fundraising endowment, Community Preservation Act funds, um, and then uh, financial modeling and impact on other projects is, uh, for and just general operating budgets. Because uh, um, Sharon Sherry hopefully will be able to be with us next time. So um, I think that uh, I, I will welcome if uh, any members of the committee wish to touch on subjects now, but that is our plan for next time. And uh, we are gonna have a second full meeting on the subject of the library, just recognizing that uh, this was such a big t topic that it covers, uh, it, it really required two meetings and it required us to move the OPEB question to um, later meetings after we're done with uh, the, these two library focused meetings. So back to the committee, are there any other questions that people would like to raise today or comments that um, our guests would like to offer uh, before we uh, adjourn today's section? This, with the next meeting, we'll also wanna have just a general discussion on how we're going to report back to the um, council um, at the conclusion of our um, two-week, two-meeting two investigation. So I see none, and I, um, so I think I'm going to turn it to Sean for a moment. Um, Sean, did you have anything that you wanted to say in particular to um, about the, or did you have anything to show us a breakdown on the um, changes that you've made to the projected operating budget for FY22? And with that, I thank the live uh, people of here from um, the architecture firm and the OPM, um, but we're not, uh, we're not going to come back to library when we're just talking on general operating budget. You're welcome to stay, but obviously we appreciate you having been here and uh, just wanted to assure you that um, the, the library in particular is not going to come up again in today's meeting. And so um, if you disappear, we certainly appreciate you having been here and thank you. So thank you, Sean. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Andy. So, um, you know, this year with COVID and everything going on, we've been updating our revenue projections a little more frequently because obviously things are changing pretty quickly. Um, so the, see, Paul made me get this webcam and now I can't get it secured and it keeps falling on me. There we go. All right, there we go. Um, so, so yeah, so we updated our revenue projections of, uh, last week and we have a little bit of good news to share. Um, we were able to get operating budget increases up to 2.1% from 1.5%. And the major components that shifted in a positive direction are that we updated new growth. Um, I think it was at around 500 or 550 during the last projection. We worked with the assessor's office and we feel confident we can bring that up to 600,000 for new growth. Uh, we also had a major, our, our annual large motor vehicle excise tax commitment, which dictates how much revenue we're gonna bring in for ex, uh, motor vehicle excise tax. Um, and so the number we were projecting was a little bit lower than what we did. So we felt, um, we beefed that up, I think about 50,000. And then we also started to include cannabis revenues. So we, um, and to be clear, this is the tax on cannabis revenues, um, not the impact fee. So this is the money that the cannabis dispensaries pay to the state. And then the state turns around, takes whatever portion they keep and gives us the town's portion. Um, so we have a conservative estimate of about 195,000. I'll send the, um, I'll send the projection sheet out after. So everybody has it and or post it in the packet. Um, and then the other big thing that wasn't really a, it doesn't affect the revenues or expenses, but it's good for this group to know sort of where things are headed is, um, at the JCPC level, we're looking at rolling over the capital reserve that was approved last year, that it was about $706,000 that was set aside as a, for like an emergency reserve if some sort of capital need came up during the year. Um, nothing has come up. So at the when we're planning for FY22 capital, our plan is to roll that capital reserve over to next year to support capital projects in FY22. And so what that means is we, we do have to appropriate that still. So on the the budget worksheet that you'll, I'll send out to everybody, you'll see in the other financing sources section, there's a new amount for that 700 plus thousand dollars um, that would be basically reappropriating this capital reserve. And then on the expense side, there's a similar amount that is being offset. Um, there were a couple other little changes, but those were, were the, the major things. And so we've communicated that information to the library and the school, so they're aware of that. Um, you know, they're getting very close to their decisions, to making final decisions on their budget. So we wanted to make sure they had it. And I'm happy to answer any questions on it. Kathy, I uh, wanted to um, see if you had anything to say as uh, chair of JCPC, but you also have your hand up maybe about other matters, so. No, no, I just, you know, and JCPC, um, just so people know, I mean, uh, Sean and the staff have done a really good job of bringing in a budget in terms of capital requests that matches the amount of money we have to spend, which is quite nice as opposed to being $4 million more than what we have to spend. So my- We're trying a new concept. Of <laughs> <laughs> and, and the next year also is getting near, near to be balanced. So my question is the interaction between operating and capital and the modeling you showed us on a what if, um, does you had showed us that if we tried to do all five projects, four projects, um, like there is a fifth out there, but anyway, the four projects with the library, fire, DPW, and then schools being an override, that there was a squeeze on operating budgets, um, not this coming year, but the following year, FY23. Does the new information you have on revenues make FY23 look better also. So that's my, my question looking out of it because, um, uh, you know, and I realized two of the, two of the other assumptions were uh, fire and DPW would both be taking money during those years. So we'd have three big ones happening over a short period of time, but it's um, the interaction with the Jones Library discussion is partly an operating budget discussion also. So I just wanted to know whether if there is, you don't have to say you've got it updated, but you know, if, if there is an update on what that scenario looks like, I think it would be good to see it if we could see it. Yeah, I can say a few, um, a little bit more about that. So we'll actually talk about that a little bit at the next finance committee meeting when we talk about one of the questions I know was about that operating 
capital interaction that you described. So we'll talk about it in more detail then. Um, so it does help because it, it raises the baseline that we were looking at. So, you know, instead of it being a one and a half percent baseline, now it's a 2.1% baseline. Um, so it does help in that respect that we're projecting a higher amount. Um, you know, we're still anticipating when we go from eight and a half percent for capital to 10% for capital, that if, if our local reven revenues don't recover quickly or as quickly as they could, um, that again, we might be in that one to 2% range for operating budget increases. Um, however, the, the piece of optimism is, again, if things start to bounce back quickly and, and you know, we've seen our revenue estimates rise steadily throughout this process, you know, if that trend continues and then revenues continue to rise, um, you know, we could be in a better place. Again, it's, we're projecting out a couple of years and, and how things are gonna play out here. Um, but again, the faster our local economy gets back to normal, if it could even just get, again, if it can just get back to close to normal, then it's not much of an issue. Um, yeah. the, the pandemic is really what created that sort of squeeze between the operating budget and capital. It's not, you know, the, we've been planning for these four building projects for a while. So if we would stay to 10%, we wouldn't be having this, you know, having to do this sort of analysis the same way. Um, so, we'll, we'll, we're, but we are doing the analysis and we're gonna keep updating it as we get more information. Thank you. Any, any money out of the new federal stimulus that has yeah. for state and local government? So it feels funny talking about all this because I know every time I say something and it's gonna change. Um, so, so, you know, there are estimates out there of, of, you know, a significant amount of money available to Amherst as, as well as many other communities. Um, we're still, you know, we've got general, a general sense of the types of things that money can be used for. Um, but we haven't gone down into like the specifics of how much can be used for what, you know, how much is going to be, can be used for this fiscal year, how much can be rolled over. That's the, the piece of that we're really going to dig into as soon as that information is sort of shared out officially from the state with us. Um, and again, that could also affect these projections once we get that information. So the timing kind of, you know, it's okay for the town, the timing, but it, it's tough on the schools and the library um, that are working on their budgets now. Um, you know, what I've told them is be flexible and be ready to adapt, um, kind of like we all had to do the last year and a half or so. Um, but yeah, the, we have seen uh, the amount of money that's projected, not, it's not finalized yet, and we're digging into the specifics. And as soon as we get into that piece of it, um, I'm sure we'll have an update for the committee. Does federal government have any, uh, in, in the statute is passed, does it have any specifics that give us guidance already? So there, you know, Paul may want to weigh in because he's he's heard a little bit more. Um, you know, there, there is talk of it potentially being available for revenue loss, which is one of the big things that we've been hoping for. Um, and, and then there's some other pieces related to, um, potentially supporting enterprise funds and things of that nature. But again, we haven't received sort of the official, or I haven't received yet the official uh, webinar, you know, report from the Department of Local Services that says, you know, here's the detailed list and how you calculate how much you can use. Um, so again, we'll, we'll come back. I'm sure we'll update the committee as soon as we get that. So Paul, I haven't seen that Paul's looking to, uh... Yeah, I just I would just support what Sean said. It's it's very early. It's a significant amount of money that's being given. There's formulas that they're applying to how the money is being forwarded from the federal government to the state government to localities, um, and they also filter in a, a county format as well. Um, but and then they've I've just heard, and I, again we haven't seen a, a, anything official on this that they want to talk as he as Sean mentioned enterprise funds. They're talking about water, sewer, broadband, sort of infrastructure type things, and that would be significant for us because we are ready to go on some of those projects, and we could sure use the funding for, to support that that work. And we took a large hit on water and uh, sewer fund. Right. And the key that we've always wanted, we wanted with the CARES Act was to, was revenue replacement because, you know, we, along with every other community, had a loss of revenue from our, our various funds, our enterprise funds and our transportation funds and things like that. So we'd like to see, to get those back to where they were because we lost a whole year of revenue on many of those things. And that has put us in a very challenging position. Um, I mean, again, the, the good thing is that we all, in each of those enterprise funds, we've had some reserves so we could cushion that but we'd like to get back to where we were a year ago. We had some reserves, but we also made some decisions to not ask for the same uh, 
reimbursement to the town for expenses that the town incurs on behalf of the enterprise funds. Precisely, yeah. Uh, one other thing that I just wanted to point out to the committee, and I, not something for heavy discussion, I see Lynn's hand up, but uh, the um, cannabis excise tax, um, I think that the presumption is, is that it's an excise tax equivalent to meal and lodging tax, and that um, it therefore um, should be expended within the budget under the same charter rules that apply to other, the, the similar kinds of excise taxes, that it's not a distinct or unique piece that can be peeled off for a purpose, which is different from the um, other piece of cannabis money that's coming in, which is more equivalent to the um, the housing piece for uh, short-term rentals and that's impact B. And then you're talking about what the impact on the town is for having the um, cannabis operations or short-term rentals, then you're dealing with um, having to show what the impact is and um, using the funds accordingly. Um, Lynn, you did something? Andy, you were reading my mind. It was to say that while you and Alyssa were on the select board during the whole cannabis decisions, this is something the council has never discussed uh, and it will be coming up on some agenda in the future so people understand those two streams of money. Paul? Yeah, just along those lines, I, you, you sort of said it, but I want to emphasize it by taking the tax revenue, the excise tax, and putting it in with all the other excise taxes. It filters through our process so that the library and the schools and the town all get the share of that of the revenue that comes in. It doesn't stay on one ledger. The impact fee is a different animal, and that's something that we have to have a policy discussion with the discussion with the council on about how do you want to allocate because that's money that might be there, it might go away. It's not a recurring source of revenue. So that's something that um, we would also want to engage the school department on as well as because it, it, they would be looking at using some of those funds for education or something like that. Okay, thank you. Anything else that uh, any members of the committee want to ask Sean or Paul regarding the uh, revised estimates, because if not, then I think that we've uh, had a busy day and uh, very, I think a very good meeting and I appreciate everybody's uh, participation. So with that, I will uh, say that the meeting is adjourned and uh, see you all you, everyone. two weeks away. Thank Lots you. of good information. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.